I'm going to attempt to engage with my previous colleagues talk as I go through this. So I'm going to talk of the sociology of violence, alternative gendered futures, and I'm going to attempt to locate violence in the sociological theory of society. I want to rebuild theoretical, alter theoretical debates and alternatives, reunify the field of violence, and address multiple inequalities as social systems, not identities. I want to discuss alternatives. Alternative social futures, brutal and peaceful. I want to look at theories, substantive varieties of modernity, projects for the future. And then I want to move on to discuss what I mean by unifying and making visible an analytical field of violence. And then finally, to pull together some of the issues about the relationship between violence and inequality within which obviously the issue of gender is situated. Let's start with alternative theories. Um, we've had introduced um, Weber and Kant, and I'm going to take that as one of my axes of serious disagreements within the social sciences and sociology as to how we theorize violence. I'm going to um, pick up from Weber and go back to a precursor, which is Hobbes. Hobbes and Weber had very similar notions, was that it was necessary to have a large, powerful state in order to suppress violence everywhere other than the state. Hobbes's notion was that life would be nasty, brutish, and short, unless Leviathan had these powers. Weber is a sociological interpretation of that, in which he imagined that the modern state had a monopoly of legitimate violence of a given territory. So anybody who looks at gender-based violence understands the modern state, if it was ever modern, never had such a monopoly of legitimate violence in a given territory because of the existence of domestic violence and sexual violence that the state never successfully intervened to prevent. So nonetheless, we have a theorization there, a claim that a stronger state would lead to less violence elsewhere in civil society and, uh, and elsewhere. The theorization then in practical terms leads on to suggestions of the significance of criminal justice, uh, enhancement of criminal justice um, would lead to a reduction of violence elsewhere. It's a theory of a benign Leviathan. A more powerful state reduces violence. Very focused upon the state and the relationship between the state and civil society. The alternative comes from a Kantian tradition into which I'm going to build Galtung and indeed Rambro himself uh, and feminist writers uh, like Liz Kelly. Um, there the theorization goes to the whole of society. It's not just a focus on the state. We need not only democracy, we can't call it republicanism, um, we need to engage with um, economic um, engagement, interdependence, but also the interdependence of states that's sometimes been interpreted in the contemporary world as if it was the United Nations. I choose to interpret this as a theorization. We could apply this to the European Union, of whom I think Haas is perhaps possibly one of the best theorists of the European Union as an example of a Kantian theory of peace. What's this body of theory doing? It's arguing that violence is caused by society, all of society, and that all societal institutions are relevant to understanding violence. It cannot be centered on the state. The state is far too narrow. We need to understand everything. So I'm agreeing with Jeffrey that we should be broadening it to include civil society, but more than that, we need the economy as well. We need all of those different institutions. Peace processes involve all of this. Galton's theorization of peace is a theorization in which the whole of society, all of societal institutions need to be involved in bringing down over an extremely long period of time, the rates of violence. The Haasian theorization of the European Union was that the militarist nation state uh, would forever be causing wars in Europe unless it was embedded in such a way as to diminish the powers of the nation state, which the European Union in its own territory has done, but not outside of it. So we have alternatives in theory, which are really important. We've got 
also ways to think about alternatives as societal forms, alternative forms of modernity. We have high violence societies and lower violence societies. I'm going to be very crass here and say the US is an example of a high violence society and Europe, a low violence society, relatively speaking. The neoliberal, the authoritarian generate high rates of violence. Um, we can see this uh, theorized in Garland's uh, work on the culture of control, uh, Wacon's work on neoliberalism punishing the poor. I think today we need a concept of authoritarianism in order to get a grip on what's happening in places like Russia. What we have here is a notion that violence breeds violence. If you increase violence in one institution, it increases it elsewhere. That's contrasted with an understanding of low, lower violence societies, which are much more democratic, high rates of violence, peace projects, victims um, focused, software security stra um, strategies based on reducing inequalities. The EU has a homicide rate, one fifth of the homicide rate of the, uh, of the US. Alternative projects are built around these different kinds of theorization of what gives rise to peace and what gives rise to violence. I'm gonna take the feminist responses since I've been asked to speak on gender. The traditional feminist responses to violence were of that second sort. They were about increasing targeted welfare, generic welfare, producing refuges, helplines, increasing resources, reducing gender inequalities, reducing the gender gap in decision-making. The UN Security Council Resolution 1325 was to include women in peacekeeping, to, to narrow the gender gap in decision-making. A whole series um, of issues uh, extending into civil society, renegotiating an intimacy in civil society, Me Too is part of that. So that was the traditional feminist response. What do we see today? We see a move towards an increasing focus upon the mobilization of the criminal justice state. A call for wider forms of criminal legislation, coercive interventions against perpetrators, as a priority form of action. The question is whether that's an appropriate rebalancing to ensure a minimal criminalization or whether this is a shift in an authoritarian direction. So those are our questions, those are alternatives. Theoretically, where do I think we need to go as sociology? I think we need to rebuild a field of the analysis of violence. So with, with Nisha, I, I, I agree that we, we lost that tradition post-1945. We mistakenly assumed we had peace. Wonderful idea, simply not true. The analysis of violence was then marginalized. Um, war went to international relations. Um, crime and deviancy went to criminology. Specialized forms of violence went into violence against women, went into hate crime or study of terrorism. That was a mistake, that fragmentation. We need to bring it back and have a unified field of violence, which includes internal and external, interpersonal, interstate and intergroup forms of violence. Only then can we properly analyze it. Some of our contemporary theorists have subdued the analysis of violence, they've reinterpreted it, they've dispersed it. So writers like Bourdieu, for example, talk about symbolic violence. It's not symbolic, it's physical, it's visceral involves death and pain and suffering. And calling this stuff symbolic, dispersing it into, into discourse, isn't good enough for contemporary analysis. So this is a call for a rethinking of what the field of violence should be within contemporary sociology. We need to identify it separately. So while writers like Gal Tung, I think have been very good in their analysis, bringing violence to the fore and the analysis of a total society, by saying it's everywhere, makes it really hard to say what causes what. We need the specificity of what's violence and what's not violence in order to be able to say violence isn't just all forms of power, power breeds power. We need to be able to identify which kinds of power breed other kinds of power and what the relationship is between them. That is, we need to differentiate the different kinds of power and violence has its own rhythm, modalities, in a very different kind of way. And it's particularly important in times of crisis. Uh, two minutes to go, Sylvia. Thank you. Inequality and identity. I've not used the word woman. I'm not going to use any identity concepts. I think the theoretically within sociology, they're a mistake. And in this world of violence, they're particularly a mistake. I understand the attempt to 
create pol political subjects around pol political communities in order to engage with the forms of violence. But I think strategically, analytically, this is a mistake and we should rather be understanding this as systems of inequality. We should be understanding as um, violence as being disproportionately gendered. We should be looking at the intersection of those projects. And if we're to ever get to get to grips with the significance of the intersectional issues around systems of inequality, of, uh, then we need to be able to not use concepts of identity, which harden those categories, and instead have issues which, which focus on systems. So overall, time to go back to theory, rebuild violence back into our theories of society, identify it, make it visible, have an analysis of it. And this panel has been an excellent start. Thank you.